Today, I've got a University of Oregon preview with a Ducks insider, color analyst Mike Jorgensen, and it's coming up right now. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Elite Athletes TV. I'm Mike Pulaski, former 11-year pro quarterback and quarterback's coach here at EliteAthletesTV.com. I'm also a college football color analyst. Now, this week, University of California, my home team, their game was canceled due to COVID on campus. One case, asymptomatic, but game was canceled. As a result, University of Washington, University of California will not have a game this week, but I have a chance to sit down with University of Oregon color analyst Mike Jorgensen, former Ducks quarterback, Oregon great, been doing games since 1990. Before we get into the Ducks, though, if you haven't done so yet, make sure you subscribe to the channel and ring the bell. Get notified every time we have new stuff coming up. We'll be going over Pac-12 teams, college football, X's and O's, quarterback instructional stuff. we got linebacker training. We have some of the greatest athletes in the world here at EliteAthletesTV.com. Give me a thumbs up if you're ready to hear about the Ducks, and leave me a comment down below. I'd love to hear what you think after you hear from Jorgie. Joining me now, Mike Jorgensen. Jorgie, one of the all-time greats up at Oregon, the color voice of the Ducks, and looking forward to football this fall. Finally, have to start with the news, obviously, from my hometown, Berkeley. You know, what do you think of that? We, we expected all the craziness of 2020 to continue, but you canceled the Cal Washington game. What are your thoughts from out of state? Well, it, it continues, Mike. I mean, that, that's, that's the crazy thing about it is, you know, we just had – um, Mario Cristobal last night on our coach's show. And, and it's one of those ones when, when you do that interview, I know Jerry Allen, a longtime voice of the Ducks and I, when we went to breaks, talked about the fact that how quickly it can change, how quickly things can change just on a moment's notice within a day or two, frankly. And that's exactly the case here. And, and disappointing. I, I know it's going to be disappointing, obviously, for Jimmy Lake coaching his first game as head coach at Washington and the Cal Bears with a lot to look forward to this year uh, with an excellent team and, and the addition of, uh, of, a, of another duck, Bill Musgrave right. to the staff and that type of deal. But uh, uh, yeah, again, it's just too bad, but at the same time, somewhat of not of a surprise because of how crazy things have been, as you mentioned. Yeah. I just talked to Billy the other day. He was all geeked up, ready to go. And it was literally, I talked to him maybe an hour before they got the positive COVID test at Cal. I mean, all I know is 2020 keeps finding a way to suck worse. And so this one, obviously, for the Bears, <laughs> it's just, it sucks. You know, as, you know, as an analyst, I, I'm, I was looking forward to calling this game, right? So you build up waiting for the, the football season, and it gets here, and there's a postponement, but then finally you're going to play, they make the announcement, and then first game. I mean, talk about a letdown for the kids. Yeah, especially at home. You know, that's, that's the thing about it. You get a chance to open up at home. And even though there's going to be nobody in the stadiums for the most part, uh, you know, these guys have worked their their tails off to get to this point and, and gone home and come back and gone home and, and had some, some teammates depart that have opted out or decided to move on or whatever else it might be. You know, the topsy-turvy stuff that all of a sudden you think is going to have some stability to it. I feel bad for the coaching staff and the players and that type of deal, but I also know the safety comes first and that's what this is all about. Yeah. That, I mean, obviously that's what this comes, this is, that's what it's about. You know, have to make sure you take care of the, the athletes. So anyway, let's get to the business at hand. Every time I post something about Oregon, your fans wear me out. Like the ducks fans are the most adamant fans out there going. They're fantastic. Some are really good. And then, you know, you have some guys out there that don't really know. And I posted something about Oregon's offense this year. And my whole question was just this. How can the media rank an offense so high when you're losing a all-time legend at quarterback and you have to replace five offensive linemen? How can they get such a high rating in the North when they're replacing, as you know, as a quarterback, that offensive line is the heart and soul of the entire team. You can say what you want. It all starts at the offensive line. Five new guys. How do they get such a high ranking? I mean, you're right. Number one, it starts in the trenches. Number two, usually when a team returns a quarterback from the previous year that was halfway decent, that's what will elevate a team or an offense from a standpoint of how they're ranked and how they're picked in their league, let alone nationally. So it does kind of counterbalance the deal. But you know, to me, part of the deal might be might be the head coach and frankly, some of the talent that they have at this skill position. Now, C.J. Verdell can't run for a thousand again if they can't block up front. 
Um, well, not to mention other, he's already got seven games to do it in, but you know, there's yeah, that. Right. Yeah. 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 There you go. And he, he still wants to get there. He was one yep. of our interviews last night, but uh, uh, you know, the skill guys getting the ball to the skill guys, if you can't protect the quarterback, um, it's going to be tough to get that done. But, but I, I, I do believe just based on the fact that, that they do have enough skill guys might be part of the reason. And I think Mario Cristobal and, and, and frankly, the culture that he's created here in Eugene uh, and with the Oregon football team and that type of deal and the guys that they've brought in, um, I, I still think they're going to be pretty stinking good. And, and, and part of it might be Joe Moorhead too. You know, the new offensive coordinator in from Mississippi state and, and, and what he's putting together, the offense is going to look a little bit different. Uh, you're going to see the quarterback run it a little bit more. And there's two really good athletes at quarterback that you can run throw. So that, that, that run pass option uh, that they really didn't implement at all, even though they could have with Justin Herbert, but they wanted to make sure that he stayed upright right. and all the way to the last game or last two games when they used it. But so, you know, you're right. It is counterintuitive to what you would think. And, and I'm a little bit surprised until they prove it, that that offense is going to be just as good, but it's got the potential but a lot of things to work through. By the way, over 200 starts last year between the guys on the offensive line, the combined this year, one. Right. That, I mean, that's the point. I mean, you, so Robbie Tobeck, you know, former Coug, former NFL, like 16 year player with Atlanta, Seattle, he was on my fishing show and he, he, he said the best thing I've ever heard about offensive line. He said, if a football team is like a band of brothers and the offensive line has to be quintuplets. Because they all have to be on the same page, right? It has to be that chemistry. And it takes a while to get there. I don't care how good you are physically. Communications, especially with what defenses are doing now, you know, with all the TE stunts and the blitz and the movement and all that stuff, you got to be able to communicate and have chemistry. Yeah, and that was and that was second nature to that group last year. And frankly, the last two years, with as long as, you know, Hanson and Throckmorton and Sewell and, uh, and, and Lemieux and, and all those guys had played together since freshman all the way up through, it was a foregone conclusion as to what the guy next to you was going to do. They knew it. It was intuitive. Uh, so it is a whole new group this year. Um, and it's, it's going to be a challenge. It, it is. There's no doubt about it. But, uh, you know, I think what they're hoping is to be able to get through this Stanford game uh, good and clean. They're going to make mistakes. Some things are going to happen in that type of deal. But uh, you got to get those starts under your belt in a – game type situation to figure it out and they're going to figure it out this saturday and you're going to have to do it on the fly there's no doubt and, about it but uh, and stanford's a good game for it too right not a super explosive offense and their defense although they do some fun things i love watching their defense you kind of see them coming you know they show you stuff and so it's a good game to kind of break in for oregon and i think stanford's i think stanford's continuity is going to help them big time this year but I think it, you're right. It is a great game to break in. Tell me about C.J. Burdell. I love watching him. He, he's kind of the classic or Oregon running back to me. Yeah, explosive. I mean, that, that's really what the guy is. Uh, you know, I, I sit there and I think back, and Oregon's had some good backs over the last decade to, to 15 years. And, you know, maybe LaMichael James might be the guy that I see as that explosive and, and was a physical runner for his size. But C.J. Verdell, frankly, will seek you out and try to run you over if you're in the way. Sometimes what I wish he wouldn't, frankly. I mean, he's, he's quick enough and he's fast enough and, and agile enough that I'd rather see him try to make somebody miss. But he'll pick you out and try to run over you if you get in the way. And, and he's got uh, that gnarly you know, low center of gravity, too, right? Like, like when you watch him run, he's just low and hard and thick. Like he's just, just a stud yeah. back. Yes, yeah, sometimes frankly gets to the hole too fast and doesn't let it develop. He'll just take that hand off and go hard. But you'd rather have that guy run for four and make 40 than try to run for 40 by running outside and running around people. And oftentimes you end up with four. So, but explosive and, and it, he's begun to mature into his body too. I mean, he's already, as you talked about, pretty compact built, you know, 205, 210 at, at 510. Uh, but he's begun to really mature into his body as a third year guy. And you really see that. I know you have over time, you see a lot of guys change between that 19 year old and 20, 21 year old, where all of a sudden they start to get some facial hair and yeah, you know, the man strength comes in. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, and then on top of that, you have Dai Habibi Likio. So, I mean, it's a whole stable of backs. Yeah, they're pretty deep. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you got three guys that return. And, and all of them do something a little bit different. Uh, you know, I would say, again, Verdell is probably the feature back. If you're going to look at a go-to back, he's the most explosive and the most dangerous of the backs. 
but the, all three of them are really good out of the backfield as receivers too. And, and that certainly helps an offense, a quarterback, uh, an offensive coordinator to be able to set up the screen game, do some different things, swing guys out and know that they're pretty good, good out in open space. And all of them are. And, you know, uh, dollars is another uh, running back that, that uh, is going to be another guy that potentially plays. They may play four or five guys because they're that deep at that position, but the three you just mentioned, you know, TD Leakio, we call him because it seems like anytime they get first and goal inside to five, he gets the ball out, goes Verdell, which I'd be pissed, by the way. Yeah, they sub him in, right? Give the guy. Yeah, I work us down the field. <laughs> no doubt about it. All right, so now let's talk the, the marquee position, right? Justin Herbert, who I watched have two of his greatest games of all time versus Cal when I was calling the games for Cal. Just phenomenal quarterback. You've got to replace him coming in, and he replaced a great quarterback too, right? So, so you keep coming in with great quarterbacks at Oregon. It's Tyler Shuck, right? Pronounced Shuck? Correct. Yep. So tell him, tell him, firstly, he needs to buy a consonant because that's not spelled right. <laughs> Secondly, <laughs> tell me about him because I watched game film, and I did a review on him. You guys can see the card right here if you want. Um, but I reviewed him. I liked him as a quarterback. He showed some toughness. He's got accuracy. He's got good technique. Like He's got some stuff going. He just doesn't have starts. I mean, that, right. that really is what it about it is about in game time plays. I mean, he has come in in situations, whether it's mop up in the last quarter against in Nevada or or getting spot play against USC last year when he had to come in in a couple of different situations when uh, Justin got hurt and had to go back in the game. And he came in fresh, ready to go. He's prepared. He reads defenses. Uh, I, I think he, he's a guy who understands how the whole thing works. And as a freshman, you could see it, that, that he sees the field well, he anticipates things well. Uh, what he couldn't get away with as a freshman that he could partially get away with now is he would throw the ball a little bit late. And you know as well as I do at this next level up, you can't be late. And you know more than I know at the NFL level, you really can't be late. Really can't make, be late. <laughs> yeah, you got to make your decision right and deliver it or you can't be delivering at all now he is two years older from that freshman year uh very good in the pocket uh but i think what kind of what people don't understand about him is the type of athlete he is for the size he is he's very much like justin herbert from the standpoint of his ability to move run the ball uh make make decisions on the run throws well on the run and again, that fits into Joe Moorhead's philosophy, particularly when and I'm not going to skip to Anthony Brown yet. But when you've got another guy that can do that, you've got two guys now that could do that. Uh, whereas last year you were a little hesitant, even though Shuck, I think, I think would have done a nice job if Justin would have ever got hurt. Um, you got two guys now that you can be a little bit more open, uh, a little bit more carefree with, I guess, if that's uh, the right words for it. But yeah, I think Tyler's T Tyler's got a high ceiling, but being a starter, starting from down one and preparing to be a starter is a different thing altogether. He's got the leadership qualities. The team respects him. Um, he has a whole different mentality on the field than you would see him off the field. Uh, he's the guy in command, and it clearly shows, and I think the team responds really well behind him. So key, all those reps at that starter position. When you start getting those starter reps and you get to see it in practice, the game just cleans up for you. That's what people don't realize. They, they think the game gets harder. Games get easier than it is in practice against your team, generally speaking. Yeah, and against this defense in particular, I think he gets tested week in and week out by some excellent players. And so that's what is, I think, also lifted the performance of him individually and that quarterback position is – Day in and day out, they're seeing, you know, one of the best defenses in the country. Mind you, they've lost a few guys at that DB position that, you know, have decided to move on and that type of deal. But there's a lot of guys that come back, so it gets tested every single day by the best. So, obviously, on the receiver side, you got some studs at receivers. So, we've kind of covered the offense. I don't want to, get, you know, slight those guys, but you've got studs at receivers too. Let's go to the defense because that is the big key this year for Oregon. You, you have a freshman last year in Thibodeau who comes in, right? He is, the, he is the crown jewel of recruiting for Oregon at that spot. Everybody wants this kid. He comes in, and he balls, and he is a player, and he is preseason all Pac-12. And, like, everybody's looking to this guy now. Talk to me about the impact he makes on that defense. Came on Thibodeau, I'll tell you, uh, lived up to it last year, lived up to the hype. Uh, you know, as he got deeper into the season, the more effective he became. And at the end of the season, he was most effective when they really needed him. 
uh, you know, the Pac-12 championship game against Wisconsin down in the Rose Bowl. Uh, he came to play. And, and this year, what's pretty interesting about it, Mike, is he's, he's 15 pounds heavier and still has the mobility and the ability to ch- chase people down, to cover in the flat, to be an edge rush guy. Um, he's one of those kind of rare guys that, that uh, you, know, you see from time to time that are just dialed in every single play. The motor never stops. Uh, they train that way. They play that way. They practice that way. Sometimes you wish they would turn it down, but they never turn it down. Uh, and he's one of those type of guys that, that I think is going to, again, continue. Now, he's no surprise this year. And I'm not, I'm not saying he wasn't as – people didn't pay attention to him last year, but you still think, okay, five-star guy, you know, highly touted recruit, but he's a freshman. He's going to make some mistakes. We can take advantage of him, that type of deal. He didn't get taken advantage of last year. And now he's more physical. Uh, he was a guy who didn't do a single leg squat before he came to college, which just blows me away. And uh, now he's beginning to fill into that body – and, and I think he's going to be a guy that uh, people are going to have to pay attention to. And, and frankly, not to go off subject, but when you talk about a team maybe being ranked as high as they are in the league and nationally, that's the side of the ball, I think, that's helping out with a piece of it because uh, they return a lot of good players on defense, him being one of them, obviously. Right. As quarterbacks, we both hate to admit it, but defenses do win championships. <laughs> and They do. And you got a pretty solid set there. Defensive line, obviously, Jordan Scott is also a beast up front. He's, he's a dude. When you look at him, you're like, eh. And then you watch him play, you're like, oh, yeah, now, now I get it. I see it. You know, it, the eyeball test with him is not his best test. But watching game film, you get what he is. Yeah, wait till you see what he looks like now. The eyeball test, you'll go, he passes it now. He oh, looks, no kidding. He looks, he looks like a completely different guy. He wow. and Kayvon Thibodeau, it's like he handed off the weight to Thibodeau and hit, Thibodeau took it, and he gave it up. I mean, he just and, – and the thing about it with Jordan Scott now is he becomes an every-down player because that's what I think hurt him at the size, if anything, because he technique-wise a really good player and has been since he got here as a true freshman. But now he's a first down, second down, third down guy, not just a first and second down guy. And so that's what he's played himself into. It takes a lot of work to get to that point. I mean, it's tough for me to say he's down to 310 and looks like a wide receiver, but down to. he does. He does. He looks completely different. Yeah, well, again, and so I think the single digit didn't help him either before, you know, it was (laughs) it was not slimming like he had hoped, but he was a hell of a football player. player. And and you're gonna need those defensive guys up front because you lose both your linebackers coming into the season, right? Yeah, I mean you lose Die in particular. That that that's the main guy on the inside. You know, uh Isaac Slade Matao T is a really good player on the inside and is gonna continue to be and has to kind of take that leadership role. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And Mace Funa on the outside is another guy. Uh, but, you know, he, he Troy Dye is the main guy that they lost, the leading tackler on the team all four years he was here. Um, and one of those kind of energetic guys that dances on the sideline when the shout song comes on in Autzen Stadium and everything else that goes with it. You know, the biggest mystery is who's going to be the new dance queen. But we'll see. We'll see when Saturday <laughs> gets here. Uh, and, and so what that comes back is, you know, a guy like Noah Sewell. Uh, is one of the guys that you look to uh, as a true freshman. You don't want to have to lean on a guy like that, but, you know, he's a guy that they're going to have to maybe potentially look to 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 be one of those type of guys. Uh, You know, the other guy uh, on the inside that they're looking at is Drew Mathis, a JC transfer. Uh, He played some last year uh, behind Troy Dye when he was out from time to time with some injuries and that type of deal. Not very often he was out, but when he did, Drew Mathis played. And Drew right now, I think, is the guy that they're looking to as a starter. But I can tell you, uh, Noel Sewell is right at his heels. And and then Justin Flo on the other side behind Matau Utia, another five-star type of guy. But I think Sewell seems to be coming along a little bit quicker. It, it's tough to tell, though, you know, when you're not out of practice and be able to watch these guys as we normally would. But, you know, from what the coaches seem to infer and when they're talking about it, that inside group is, is pretty good, pretty deep. And they're deep on the outside, too, with Adrian Jackson and Mace Funa and Kayvon Thibodeau. And so they've got some guys, as you know, also become pretty valuable guys on special teams when you have that type of depth with guys that are 6'3", 6'4", 235, or 240 that can run the field. So Yeah, run yeah. the 4'5 down the field, just big gunners, crazy. Um, t- so tell me about the defensive secondary. Some guys opting out, some guys out. Let's talk about what they're going to be like in that defensive secondary. 
Well, you know, they're not going to be as deep as they would have been. I mean, that, that's probably the main thing. I mean, when you get a guy like Javon Holland, who's going to be a, a high NFL draft pick and, and a really, really good player, opt out. Uh, Brady Breeze, a Rose Bowl defensive MVP, and really played a second half of the season last year that, that was tremendous. Uh, Thomas Graham at the corner position. Uh, all guys that are really top-notch type of players uh, decide to opt out. And so – now you bounce to guys like, you know, Delmer Lenore also had opted out, decided to come back. So they got a guy back in him, a starter that's been a starter the last two years. So he'll be a third year starter, uh, probably leads that group. Mikhail Wright is another guy on the opposite side, a great kick returner, had a couple of kick returns for touchdowns last year, but played a lot at that corner position as well, uh, is going to be probably the starter on the other side. And then the safeties, there's going to be some guys. I mean, Verone McKinley played the nickel last year, uh, a really good player. He's a red, red shirt freshman. He'll have a chance to kind of come out of Holland's and Breeze's shadow now, and I think he's going to do that. Jamal Hill is the other guy who's kind of stepped forward, uh, a guy that, frankly, I think got just mixed in with a bunch of the names last year as a, as a guy that, hey, he may turn out to be pretty good. The offseason work that – that he has put in and the way that he's excelled in this fall camp uh, is going to be a guy that, that's going to play a lot of football. And then Nick Pickett, who played again at the safety position last year, not a starter, but they've had, they've got some guys that have played a lot of downs back there. Again, it's just the depth. You would have had such high quality depth with those other three guys, uh, but you got what you got right now. And, and I think they're going to be pretty dang good in that backside as well. Yeah, welcome to 2020, right? So, yeah. that, that, by, by the way, that was a PhD. That was like a dissertation paper on the Oregon Ducks. So, bravo for doing your homework. That I mean, that yeah, is thank awesome. You. Thank you. Getting ready for the season. Mm-hmm. Obviously, first game coming up this weekend. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot. Do the Ducks win the North this year? Yeah, I do. I cool. do. I mean, that, that, wasn't any, that wasn't any doubt. That was just, yeah, they're going to win it, period, yeah, right? partially because of the defense that I think uh, people are going to have a real difficult time with. But I think progressively as the year goes on, the offense is going to get better. And so the early start, early successful start at home and then up, up in the Palouse against Washington State is going to be really, really important to get off to a, a good start uh, against teams that, you know, maybe aren't picked to be at the top of the North or the top of the 12. But at the same time, it gets you some confidence both home and away to be able to, you know, say, hey, listen, we can do it with an offensive line of guys that nobody is going to have heard of before, before the first two games. Um, we're going to be able to get it done with a quarterback who we think is going to be pretty good, but he has to prove it type of situation. And I think a pretty tried and to, a true tested defense in that type of deal. So, you know, the, the game down in Berkeley is going to be huge. I mean, Cal with, with Chase Gar with Garbers and, 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 and with a really good defense and, and a bunch of returning guys and that type of deal, I can see why Cal's being picked the way they are. And so, you know, hopefully it ends up those two teams beating heads against each other for the Pac-12 North because uh, Oregon plays Washington the last game of the season. You know, no more Oregon State the last game of the season. It's Washington mid-December, as we right. that saying. Mid-December yeah, well, we get- and October. Cal gets Stanford right after Thanksgiving for the fourth game of the, well, third game of the season now. So, and who knows that Oregon game may be Cal's first game of the season. I mean, the way yeah, yeah, is who, going, who knows what happens, but there's no telling, but, but I, I have a feeling and, and I hope I'm right. I have a feeling that it's going to be Oregon Cal button heads down in, in Berkeley for the, for the PAC 12 North North championship and, uh, and, and hope it ends up that way. It'd be fun. Yeah, that would be great. And for all those Ducks fans that are watching, I'm actually a big fan of the Ducks. I love uh, Oregon football. If, if, when Oregon football is good, the Pac-12 is good. And so I love seeing Oregon play well at the top of their game. Um, and I yeah, am a fan yeah. of all Pac-12 football for that matter. Yeah. I mean, it ain't gonna, it ain't gonna be easy. I mean, that's the thing about it. It's it's not gonna be easy. And so my my quick answer of yes, I don't want to to sound overly confident uh, or overly cocky. I just I think they got the makings to be able to win the North. I think Cal does too. Really yeah, well, you know, and the Pac-12 is the conference that eats its own all the time. So that is where yeah. we are. Seems I appreciate well, you coming on with me, brother. I uh, I would say I'm looking forward to seeing you this year. But since we're all doing games from home <laughs> this year, I won't see you. But I will have you back on this year, especially when that Cal Oregon game's coming up. I'd love to talk to you again. Yeah, I look forward to it. Mike, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, brother. Good to talk to you.
So a super inside look at the Ducks. I still want to see how that offensive line gels, but they are super talented up in Eugene. Remember, if you haven't done it yet, subscribe to the channel. Ring that bell. Get notified every time we have new stuff coming out. Give us a thumbs up if you liked hearing about the Ducks, and leave a comment down below. Don't forget, share this video out. Family, friends, teammates, fans, anybody who likes football content or sports instructional content, that's what we do here at EliteAthletesTV.com. Hope you enjoyed it today. I know that you have a lot more knowledge about the Ducks because I do, and I had already studied them. So it was great to hear from Jorgie. Thanks again, Mike. Appreciate it. And I will look forward to talking to you guys next time with some more college football information, quarterback training, football skills. You know, we can't do it all here at EliteAthletesTV.com. Talk to you again soon.